Welcome to Rockford Reading Daily. We are beginning a new book today, which is entitled Hinterland, America's New Landscape of Class and Conflict, uh, written by Phil A. Neal. Um, I have not read this book before. It was given to the May 30th Alliance as a gift in 2021. So I am very happy to be getting the chance to, to dive into this book. I think it's going to be very informative and probably tie in pretty good with the book we just finished reading, Evicted, and also High Risers, and the book we read entitled, uh, it's escaping my mind now, uh, Class, Citizens, Community, and Power, Citizens, Police, and Power. I, I just, I butchered, I butchered the, the title of that book. Sorry about that. Uh, but this book is not too long. This is shorter than some of the last books we've read. I think our last few books have been close to 300 pages each. This one's about not even 200 pages. So we'll get through this pretty, pretty easily, pretty quickly, I should say. Uh, please share this on, from wherever platform you're listening to it on. You can share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, share it on Instagram. We listen. We put these episodes out on SoundCloud, on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, Facebook. So wherever you can find audio, we have this audio available for people. And uh, if you have not listened to previous episodes of Rafa Reading Daily, I would encourage you to please do that. And if by the time you get a hold of this, there's future episodes out, I would encourage you to listen to those future episodes as well. And let's dive into our new reading, Hinterland. Introduction, The Cult of the City. The train hurled through the hot, mist, damp blackness of southern China. If you stood in the barren, if you stood in the barren cavities between cars, you could feel the air as it was sucked into the compartment via thin windows slit in the metal like narrow wounds. The stink of factories and endless fertilizer-soaked fields pushed against the claustrophobic smell of food and bodies. Nothing was visible outside save for the few platforms we stopped at, small oases of yellow lit concrete lodged within a jungle of limestone cliffs, cash crops and half-abandoned industrial sites all sinking in the hot darkness, a dull orange glow on the horizon like fires burning somewhere behind the karst plateaus. At each platform, more people entered mostly migrant workers hauling their belongings on their backs in gigantic plastic fiber mingong bags, all the same pastel plaid. For the first eight hours, no one seemed to disembark. Like me, none of the migrants had bought seats. Chinese trains have an elaborate hierarchy of ticket types, the lowest and cheapest being the standing tickets, which entitle you to entry but nothing else. Most people with these tickets stand or sit in the aisles and in the spaces between cars. If you're lucky, the other tickets were underbooked and you get a seat without the extra cost. Otherwise, you can negotiate for half a seat shared with a stranger or simply squat in the mire of trash and sleeping bodies strewn down the aisle. Some people had, some people had come prepared with small fold-out stools Others sipped instant noodles as they slumped against their plaid plastic bags filled with whatever necessities they'd used to build makeshift, li makeshift lives in the dormitories and run-down rentals of some boom town. This was in 2012, during the tail end of the Chinese commodity bubble driven by the post-crisis stimulus package, much of which was funneled into large-scale infrastructure projects attempting to lay the groundwork for further development in the interior. As growth stagnated in the coastal capitals, boom towns proliferated in lesser known secondary and tertiary cities in the poorer provinces. But as the stimulus hemorrhaged, hemorrhaged and these interior hubs failed to grow at the same rate as their coastal forebearers, the construction projects were finished with only a small measure of factory jobs left in their wake. As investment slowed, the migrants packed up their plaid sacks and moved elsewhere. I stared out the slits in the middle I stared out the slits in the meadow into endless horizons of receding light. People shuffled up and down the cars, each looking as if they were searching for something specific, 
as if they lost someone they knew or heard, or heard of open seats in the next car over. But really, they were wandering aimlessly. There was no one to find and nowhere better that could be reached from here. Some would stop near me, red-faced, taking swigs from dark bottles of Irogutu, a dizzyingly strong liquor distilled from sorghum. They'd offer me some and try to ask questions in English, where I was from, why I was here, what America was like. America is pretty much like China, I would tell them. No, they shake their heads. America must be better, they said, because in America, you have guns. And then that's a changing of the theme within this chapter. Uh, Here, let's keep reading before we have reflection. Constellations. The stops became more and more infrequent, oasis of concrete drying up as we approached China's far hinterland of emptied villages, emptied villages and hissing insects. In these areas, the vast majority of the working age population has simply left, returning only during the spring festival, if at all. Five or ten years ago, the villages would have been all old people and children, but today, even the extended families tend to migrate if they can. Handfuls of elderly residents are all that remain, wandering through largely uninhabited villages encircled by the tombs of ancient ancestors. The train now felt like a bullet shot between two points. Its claustrophobic pressure was simply the physical force of our acceleration through the economy's outer atmosphere, compressing us within the steel carcass while the world itself was reduced to a series of points. This isn't something unique to China, though the gigantism of Chinese development here, as elsewhere, provides a pristine example of the central tendency. The planet created by global capitalism is a serrated one. Some germa- some geomorphologists have taken to calling this economic earth the, quote, technosphere, end quote. A scheme of human enhanced advi- advection, excuse me. A scheme of human enhanced advection processes comparable in scale to those of the hydrosphere or biosphere, but marked by its intense tendency toward agglomeration and long distance mass transport. Okay, that word is pronounced agglomeration. And the definition of it is a mass or collection of things in assemblage, agglomeration. Agglomeration. I don't know if you could hear that or not. Uh, I encourage anybody that's reading, if you're reading something and don't know the definition, to take a moment, look it up. Context is everything, but uh, still important to know specific definitions. Okay. Economic activity shapes itself into sharper and sharper peaks centered on palatial urban cores, which then splay into megacities. These hubs are themselves encircled by mega regions, which descend like slowly sloping foothills from the economic summit before the final plummet into windswept wastelands of farm, desert, grassland, and jungle that farthest hinterland like a vast sunken continent that met its ruin in some ancient cataclysm, populated now with broken-looking people sifting through the rubble of economies stillborn or long dead. And I've seen this, we've seen this word now a few times besides the fact the book is named Hinterland, but this is the definition of hinterland. The often uncharted areas beyond the coastal district or river's banks, an area lying beyond what is visible or known. German origin for the word. The Chinese megacity is different only in scale. If anything, decades of suppressed migration, agricultural protections, and strong property endowments in the countryside have made China less urban than it otherwise would be, despite popular images of traffic-clogged highways barely visible through draw through dull red smog. Its official urban urban excuse me, excuse me, its official urban population sat at a mere 56% in 2015, with many smaller towns and sprawling village networks not quite cohering into true cities. Compared to Japan, Europe, or the U.S., this is a meager number. 
but it is largely consistent with the global average of 54% as of 2014, with the developed countries balanced out by the heavily rural parts of Asia and Africa. In recent years, this share has only accelerated its increase, as smaller urban zones and megacities of 10 million or more all continue to grow, a rate that is fastest in the regions that have retained the largest shares of rural population. In a supposedly, quote, post-industrial, end quote, economy, it is the dense metropolitan cores of, quote, global cities, end quote, such as London, New York, Tokyo, and Shanghai, that seemingly helmed the world. Overall, cities accounted for 90% of total economic output in the United States in 2011, with New York's urban area alone producing a gross metropolitan product the size of Canada's entire GDP. Concentration is particularly strong among high-end services, such as the fire, finance, insurance, and real estate industries, producer services like law firms or marketing agencies, and the slew of high-tech and professional positions staffed by the, quote, creative class, end quote. This produces a, quote, great divergence, end quote, in which the population becomes increasingly segregated across cities and regions, signaled by trends in everything from voter participation to income and life expectancy. Cities farther down the chain compete to reinvent themselves as international metropoles in their own right, attractive to both the high-tech, high-finance crowd, crowd and the sensibilities of the new hipster urbanists. Local governments pay premium fees to hire quasi-mystical consultants promising to reveal the rituals capable of attracting, quote, creatives, end quote, whose exotic millennial culture seems somehow so far beyond the kin of the polo-wearing city administrator. Meanwhile, Slums are demolished to make way for, quote, walkable, end quote, neighborhoods peppered with cafes, CrossFit gyms, and cupcake shops. All of this is undertaken with a maddening zeal for the urban project itself, whether propagated by blind faith economists or the bearded settlers of Brooklyn. And such zeal has led to a situation in which the very core of urban space, downtown and its flanking neighborhoods, downtown and its flanking neighborhoods, has become the blindingly singular focus of politics. All right, let's have a reflection. So we are, we find the author in in China riding on a train. And I think the first thing that stands out to me is the vocabulary that's being used and the, the cadence that he's writing in. And for me, it always takes maybe uh, 15, 20 pages to figure out the rhythm or the cadence that the the author writes in and the, the language that he uses or that they use, excuse me. Uh, and so that's some of the things that I'm, I'm picking up on as I'm going through and reading it. I've already been introduced to a, a couple of different words that I was not familiar with before. I'm always happy to dive into a book and get introduced to new vocabulary get introduced to new ideology get used to introduce to new to new facts to get introduced to new opinions and so those are new perspective those are all important and i've seen those ha that happen already in some of these first pages we read the first sentence that really stands out to me is <clears throat> america is pretty much like china i would tell them no, they shake their heads. America must be better, they said, because in America you have guns. And this is just another reminder of the the output of violence that happens in this country and the, out, well, the output of gun violence that happens in this country and how unique it is to this country and how well known it is in other places that this is a, a, a attribute of this country. And I don't think that is a positive attribute. I know that a lot is made of the Second Amendment and having the right to bear arms. And I'm not anti Second Amendment or anti having the right to bear arms. But I do think that we have sort of jumped the shark on the, the gun aspect of this, this society and this country. And and I think that that happens because of, of capitalism, because capitalism has ballooned to such an effect 
to such a yeah to such an effect that you know the gun industry is not an industry that is about protecting people or keeping community safe or keeping neighborhoods people safe it's about making as much money as possible and so making as many guns and as many ammunition as possible and making sure that laws don't get passed to prevent people from being able or to make it difficult for people to buy guns and and so those are just some of the quick thoughts i have from that sentence there and then when the author when Phil Phil like Neil begins to talk about the changing of the planet. The uh, the planet created by capitalism is a serrated one. That sentence stands out to me a lot. I've never heard that specific term used to describe capitalism, uh, but I think that is one that is that fits. And also we see here the most of the things that we've read have been very nation uh, have given us a very close look at specific cities within the nation and issues within those cities and right here in that one sentence when he speaks about global capitalism it lets you know that we're seeing we're going to have a a wider we're getting a wider view of some of these issues that exist here and capitalism is a global issue the same way that racism is a global issue when and, and mass incarceration is also a, a global issue and police terrorism. These are all things that are global issues. And I think that it is important once you begin to get some type of understanding locally to expand that out to nationally and then to expand that out, expand that out to globally. And so those, again, some of the thoughts that I have. And then when he begins to describe the uh, when he begins to describe the change in where people live at when he begins to cha- describe the change in, in uh, country areas sort of becoming city areas and the in mega cities being created and all of those things are very familiar with the realities we've watched take place in America over the last couple of decades. And he speaks about here. Meanwhile, slums are demolished to make way for quote walkable in quote neighborhoods peppered with cafes, CrossFit gyms and cupcake shops. And that's something that's very true to, to Rockford. I was just telling somebody the other day, it's like four or five coffee shops that are downtown in Rockford and, and people who lived in Rockford, 15, 20 years ago can tell you that that area used to be vastly different. And I've once had somebody tell me, well, is gentrification a bad thing? If it's an area that's, uh, that's slipping into decline and it needs to be, to be changed and people aren't having livable, aren't living in live, aren't living in adequate uh, housing environments. Shouldn't those things be changed? And I, I do agree that those things should be changed, but they, should not be changed in a way they should be progressed and progressing them means making sure that people who already live in these communities have better housing in the communities, have better employment in the communities, have better uh, resources in the communities, not trying to dislocate or dis or replace those people from those areas and communities. And then trying to put in uh, more coffee shops or CrossFit gyms or cupcake shops, uh, And then this last sentence here, uh, and such zeal has led to a situation in which the very core of urban space downtown and its flanking neighborhoods has become the blindingly singular focus of politics. And we see that taking place here in Rockford. Uh, Just the last 12 months, they've uh, the city of Rockford, I believe, spent three hundred thousand dollars on a PR campaign paid to have stories put in Forbes. They're getting uh, money. Be, money's being from the state being brought in to uh, upgrade theaters that are downtown and upgrade areas of downtown. Uh, these the, And these are all the same type of things that are being spoken about within here. And I just think it's important that we can identify when these things are happening close to home. Okay, let's move on to the next section. Bear with me. I'm trying to, trying to get a groove here. <clears throat> Crowds. But sometimes the seemingly determined are of development sudden, excuse me, 
but sometimes the seemingly determined arc of development suddenly mutates. Crowds fill spaces built for capital. Tear gas drifts through the financial district like the specter of finance itself, as if that abstract swarm of shares, bonds, and derivatives had achieved its own ascension, tearing free from prisons of paper and computer circuitry like mist rising from a corpse. Against this haunting shape, the crowd surged with their own spectral science sentience excuse me at its most extreme the very bedrock of the city appears fissured the plaza or square now the central fault in the new urban tectonics in the first sequence of uprisings the landscape seemed almost to become the subject of the insurrection itself the people of egypt were condensed into the roiling bodies of tahrir square a mundane protest against the demolition of istanbul's gezi park was baptized in tear gas and batons, and then born again in a million-body flood. In the middle of winter in Ukraine, central Kiev was transformed into a pyramid of flame. People wandered through the smoke and snow beneath the pyre, their legs sunken in the gray wreckage. The barricades were all slowly caked with ash, as if a new skin had grown over everything, bodies surging like the muscle underneath. To those looking down from boardrooms and brownstones, the new sentience gestating in the square can only appear monstrous. Anyone who has been in such a crowd can feel the power there. The strange new logics that emerge when so many bodies are pushed together against the police and the absolutely terrifying multiplication of violence made possible in such moments. Those who seek to preserve the present order unleash their own demons against this new power. And at last, the antagonism at the heart of that vast hostage, situ hostage situation called, quote, the economy, end quote, descends into physical form as hooded youths hurl bricks against swarms of rubber bullets, the newly reborn god of the rabble wrestling with the old gods of capital. Each insurrection of the early 2010s had a local impact proportionate to its ability to draw in residents of the non-urban or peri-urban hinterland, the slums, the Bandaloos, the council housing, or even, as in the case of Bangkok in 2010, the impoverished countryside, and to fuse these populations via shared action with various fractions of the urban dispossessed, ranging from homeless people to graduates with no future. When such a combination was successful, the form it took effectively brought the city itself to the brink of death. The normal flows of goods, people, and capital all froze, as if such cities were in a state of paralysis, a condition military theorists coined, quote, herbicide, end quote, after the sieges of Vukovar and Sarajevo during the Balkan Wars. Sarajevo, Sarajevo. For the liberal urbanist, this paralysis can appear only as the death of politics, since politics is for them simply a more participatory version of city administration taking place within the sphere of civil society. A central thesis of this book, however, is that herbicide is the product of insurrection, is that herbicide as the product of insurrection is the point at which those excluded from the urban core and thrown out into the hinterland beyond, sudden, hinterland beyond suddenly flood back into it. This leads to the overloading of the city's metabolism the death of urban administration, the local collapse of civil society, and therefore the beginning of politics proper. The wealthy Syrian looking down from the high rises of Damascus at the street protest of 2011 might in all likelihood have simply thought, who are these people? The answer, of course, was that many were residents of the country's own agricultural hinterland made into internal refugees by severe drought and subsequent environmental and economic collapse. Others were residents of the city who simply saw no future in the city as it was. The feeling was much the same when urban liberals in America's coastal cities looked at the blood red election map in November of 2016. Their only possible response, who are these people? What is this place? The answer, this is the hinterland. It is the sunken continent that stretches between the constellation of spectacular cities, the growing desert beyond the palace walls. These are the people who live there. Okay, let's...
Yeah, let's end this episode here. And then we will be back tomorrow to continue reading Hinterland, the introduction, the cult of the city. And right now it feels, I'm going to sit the book down. Still trying to find my, find my, uh, my way in understanding through this, understanding the book since I haven't read it before. But right now I feel that uh, capitalism is being addressed very heavily. Uh, The class system is being addressed very heavily. What politics is and isn't is being addressed very heavily. Uh, Poverty is being addressed very heavily. Gentrification is being addressed very heavily. And I do think that part of understanding police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice has to be to understand the terrain that these things take place on. And so you have to understand Uh, how our cities function in the 21st century. And this seems to be, this book seems to be going a long way towards doing that. Uh, I'm always excited to read something that's new about combating capitalism or that gives you new understandings of capitalism and new understandings of classism. And it seems that this book is going to do that. And already this term hinterland is one that I see is going to be used very often and is one that I'm very intrigued by. So as we continue reading more and more through the book, I'll have a a better, I'll be able to better articulate some of the themes within the book and how those themes relate to themes we've already talked about in previous books and my perspective on some of those themes. So this was a, a bit of a shorter episode, but we will try to finish the introduction on the next episode and we should be able to finish the next introduction next the introduction on the next episode this was just a a starting in on a new book so please share this as i asked at the beginning on whatever platform you're listening to it on we're a little bit under 30 minutes this time that's okay i'm sure we'll have episodes within this book that go a little bit over 30 minutes so we'll get that average balanced out remember we put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide you the opportunity to begin or further your journey in the struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration, and racial injustice. And I will holler at you tomorrow.